Good morning, and uh, we're going to reconvene. Ross McDonald's with us this morning for public transit, which is, is a big issue in the state of Vermont. And I just was mentioning a few moments ago that I see they're going to start charging again. Uh, we had that year or so of no charging, and uh, so everybody will pay a little, and it'll be effective, and we want everybody to share a little bit of it. And, uh, so, Ross, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I think I need to be enabled. Mike? Yeah. Okay. I was just coming from the House uh, Committee, and uh, we ran a little late, so I appreciate the patience. All right. Let's together. Who was the chair of the House Committee? Sarah Coffey. Oh, Sarah. Yeah, I, 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 I got to send her a bill. She wants to pay for that. Okay. Okay. just for Senate. You must have had one for House, too. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I changed one of the slides that I, I gave Mike, but I think uh, we're still pretty close. Uh, but thank you for having me. For the record, Ross McDonald. I'm the Public Transit Program Manager. Um, I'm a resident of Peachum and been with the program for 16 years and the manager going on four. Um, I know that this group uh, has, has uh, not been, been here uh, previously. But to remind you, we, we have a pretty large vision where we want to uh, help people uh, who are dependent on, on, on transit, provide access to employment and other modes, mitigate congestion, preserve air quality, promote efficient energy use, and advance the state's economic development uh, objectives, all in a safe, reliable, and cost-effective, and environmentally responsible manner. So we do touch upon a lot of areas and contribute to all of these efforts and Vermont is in a really unique position where we are probably the, the, the most well-funded rural program than any other rural state in, in, the, in the nation, which really does put us in a responsible position to try to help other rural areas understand what they can do as we are working through the type of support that we're provided. Many states use Federal Transit uh, Administration formula funds only, with maybe a few state dollars. Um, for us, up to 47% of our budget comes from FHWA flex funds, or they flex FHWA funds into our FTA uh, account at the uh, federal level for us to contribute to the transit system. In addition to our budget, 44 million, uh, four to six million dollars also come from our local providers who help uh, uh, with those non-federal shares. Uh, as a result, we're able to provide fixed routes uh, with ADA paratransit service. Some of our fixed routes in the less uh, dense areas will deviate upon request um, to pick people up. We have a demand response program called Vermont Elders and Persons with Disability Program, and that works in conjunction as a braided system with uh, the non-emergency medical <coughs> transportation or the Medicaid demand response having that all under one roof with our shared infrastructure and schedule and dispatch software is critical to uh, maintaining the system as is. We support inner city services and we have a transportation demand management program 
go to Vermont that I was able to uh, work on 15 years ago. That really is to help employers and individuals um, find alternatives to single occupancy vehicles. Russ? Yes, sir. You did, maybe I missed it for a second there, but um, which section do you put the microtransit into? The inner city? Uh, no, that would be uh, the demand response program. And uh, we have the one pilot uh, that's operating now in Montpelier, and we have announced five additional pilots. You have, the but you have the demand response that's for Mount Elders and persons with disabilities, but you would cut it in that. Since it's very similar, since it's a just demand response. It's right? real time demand response. Stop, I'm sorry. Uh, real time demand response, and it's really a, a hybrid. Uh, we are replacing fixed route transit with this demand, real time demand response micro transit. Um, and so uh, that's kind of where it is. I, I should have included microtransit on this uh, slide and will. Today we'll talk about microtransit as you see, the COVID uh, ridership impacts as we maintain a lot of uh, the sanitization processes that were put in place. Uh, that transportation demand management grant program will review, uh, look at our electric transit vehicle update uh, talk about those demand response pilots um, and what we're doing with AHS um, as we further our partnership there and the community driver program as we move from volunteers to volunteers plus other options to try to um, better serve the demand response needs that are growing and are costly. So when you say demand response is that micro transit and uh, Medicaid? Is that Medicaid, everything or it, it's, so? it's, it's everything. Um, when I talk about demand response, generally speaking, it is um, the dialer ride 24, 48 hours in advance notice. We're seeing an uptick in needs. Uh, we're also seeing a reduction in volunteers since the COVID pandemic. And so we're coming up with a way to try to fill that gap between the full transit rate that we would pay or that 61 or 65 cents a mile. What about that space in between? Can we have a different hourly rate? Can we bring folks on? to drive their own sedans at the regional level and then maybe become interested in becoming CDL because we know that there's a paucity of CDL drivers in the state as well. And so almost an entry level driving position. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Do those pilot, maybe I'll talk about this, but those microtransit pilots, do those overlap with the dial a ride or do you, do you need them to be separate for federal regulations or the needs of who's driver? I think we need to overlap as much as we can and be as equitable and as efficient with Medicaid and elderly and personal disability, general public, job access, all using the same infrastructure and process. We feel that may be uh, the better use, which will be revealed through these five pilots that are in disparate communities trying to figure out is it best in Barrie or Windsor. And so that's uh, part of the initial pilot sweep of, um, of expectations and, and plans. Uh, we've been working on some studies that uh, are ready to go. Uh, the zero fare study and analysis has uh, been sent to the uh, legislature um, and happy to present that or have Steve Fobble, um, our primary consultant, uh, present uh, those uh, that analysis. And uh, we do have a, a conclusion. Um, inner city assessment every five years is required, yes, sir. Can we just hear what the conclusion is? Sure. Mean, there's a short. Oh, I um, yeah, it it's, gets complicated as you talk about uh, the impacts on riders uh, versus uh, and urban and rural. In urban systems, you have so much service and so many uh, trips that the impacts of a fare free service is, is far greater than in our rural system. In the rural system, before COVID, a third were already fare free. Two of our providers were entirely fare free. And so the conclusion is, I think it's uh, worded and it would be understandable if uh, GMT Urban went back to fares to fill uh, some rural budget issues that they have while maintaining fare free outside of the rural area. It's about a $450,000 um, uh, item for all of the rural area outside of our one city. Um, and uh, Steve did a really good job. Steve Fobble did a, a good job of showing, um, you know, the the relative diminishing return on fare free right. once you get that robust service. And one, you, yeah. announcement is in, in the line with that. 
It is. And they saw this and I think they went right, right for it. Um, and uh, they, they'll be able to talk about their other uh, pieces. The inner city assessment is every five years we need to um, show um, what, how many people are we serving, how many people have access to inner city, um, and we have a responsibility to spend 15% of our operating uh, as a way of, of accessing FTA funds on inner city services, unless we can show that less than 15% still results in a uh, reasonable inner city service. So this is what we did, um, and right now we're over 50%. But in the future, if uh, we were to make some changes, we had the assessment to allow the governor to uh, uh, make that type of declaration to get out from under that requirement. We don't want to we want to spend money for where we want uh, rather than where it's required through you know these funding formulas. Root performance report is something done every year, and I have just a slide or two from that uh, study. I'll be more than happy to come here, and that's the deep dive of the 123 routes by class. How are they performing? How are they? What does it cost? What's the overall percentage of uh, uh, of activity in the state? And that's a big one. Uh, that's what we use to assess which routes are performing, which ones may need to be changed or even cut. Um, and we haven't used that for any stat, uh, service changes since pre-pandemic, and so we're a little bit uh, behind um, on that type of activity because we didn't know where we were coming out. So is that an internal management report or is that one of the gazillion reports that we have mandated? Uh, it's mandated and um, it's, uh, it'll be done. Uh, it's out for comment. Yesterday was the uh, last day for public comment through the providers and it'll be uh, sent to the legis through the legislature next week. My question, I guess for all of us, it's when we are asking for reports, I'm kind of um, one trick pony here, but the amount of resources and the extent to which um, that the report has utility. It sounds like the way you're describing it is it provides essential data to help you make sound administrative uh, decisions and a uh, sense of how the money's being spent, who's benefiting, you know, are we getting the return and so forth. So on this, the way you talked about it, it seems like it does have utility for both the uh, uh, provider community for regional transit as well as um, statewide administrative purposes. Yeah, Absolutely. so um, my question is, am I assuming that that is correct or should we look at that report or would you be doing it anyway? It's the single most important report we do on an annual basis and the consistency over 20 years has really allowed us to track trends. It also uh, dovetails uh, with our national transit database requirement through FTA, which we have to provide a lot of the same data and then we can slice it up for our own management perspectives. It's also something, um, yeah, so without a mandate, we'd be continuing $15,000 about a year to produce it, it's, it's worth it. That's good to know. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we have a winner. And, and people read it, I'm assuming, and yeah. They do, we sir, um, a lot of we it is- We should be reading at least the uh, summary. I hope I can present, uh, especially this year, as things have changed over the last several years, and we are seeing increased costs and per trip costs. And I think it's time to to speak to it, address, and then talk about what we're going to do about those types of things. All coming from our week performance report. Um, so happy to come back and spend a half hour presenting that to you, and um, I can send that around once it goes to the legislature and have have put it in your inboxes as well through Mike. Um, I'm also just a, because of that root performance report and seeing costs and efficiency uh, uh, declines, I've been putting together a core da budget dashboard through the last seven years, pre before, during, and after, or you know, with this new normal of just where we are with operations and admin and preventive maintenance and demand response, local share, state share, all trying to just provide the baseline of data. So any questions that you would have, I would have the ability to just very quickly demonstrate where, where we are and to identify the areas that we need to work on that are maybe making up more of these cost increases than others. That's just something that um, our staff is, is working on right now. Um, uh, so to 
move forward real quick. The ridership has bounced back uh, from a low of 2021. We're at 70%. We expect uh, 2023 to be closer to the 4.1, 4.2 million um, at the end of this fiscal year. Um, so, uh, but uh, that all needs to be um, uh, completed and audited. And so we'll have those real numbers of a projected where we're still on the upward trend. Did it make a difference when it went to free fares? And what happened with that? I don't no. know. There, the, the, I will say that Chinton County has bounced back. Their in-town routes has bounced back faster than the others. I think you had a lot more need riders, more people relying on that system Plus without other options. Don't work, it work at home, so that cuts down a lot of traffic. I mean, that's, wow. it's interesting. That's uh, gotta be the big figure right here because you know half the city of Burlington work from home now. Uh, wow. Yeah, my staff uh, continues to produce from their homes primarily. Um, I like to go to the office every day. Uh, but uh, you can see on here, overall, the local bus shuttle uh, is reflective of all of these types of trip uh, travel um, uh, or uh, uh, ridership bounce backs. The one area that is an outlier that isn't bouncing back quite as fast is this commuter route. And just as you had mentioned, it's not a surprise. The real question is, what are we going to do? Or do we uh, reduce frequency from three times a day to two times a day? Do that, then you lose people that are on that bus. And you'll hear from them, oh, yeah, and I will hear. too. Um, and it's not something we relish, but- um, it's the no win. I don't know what's gonna happen. This work at home is gonna stay, or I think it's here for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I've got a gentleman who's in his 60s uh, who works from North Burlington, um, operations manager at GMT for 20 years. Um, He's, uh, it seems like our best producers continue to produce. Um, and uh, for, for me, I'm very thankful he's got that opportunity. Uh, maybe he's going to stay on for a little bit longer. And, um, uh, and Tim will, has been producing the same way, you know, since he's probably come out of college. But anything like that, that has helped. I also was able to rehire our financial person from Morrisville when we moved to Barrie. She said, that's a bridge too far. Isn't that an extra? I'm going to work for AHS, and she did. Well, since speaking with her at, at Barbara's Memorial, I was able to convince her to come back to VTrans, and we're picking her up in the Morrisville Park and Ride, uh, or not Morrisville Park and Ride, the uh, Waterbury Park and Ride when Tim comes down on his two days a week. Um, and so that type of stuff, I do have a better staff that's happier as a result. I don't know if that's the way it is for everybody yeah. and what they do. So many different scenarios. Oh. Yeah. Um, so that's where we are with ridership, but in costs, you can see why the core dashboard and, and what we're trying to uh, uh, look at is really identify why that 48, 49 million in 2022 became 52 million. We know gas costs, we know ridership was down and there wasn't the 2.2 million in um, uh, uh, fares. We, um, uh, we have new contracts, union and otherwise, everyone's paying differently. Um, and so uh, BPTA, the Vermont Public Transit Association, and I and our staff had a conversation yesterday. Uh, we'll be putting together an efficiency committee and really diving into getting back to the sustainable services that uh, we've uh, been providing. Would but that require elimination of routes? Potentially. And, and because uh, that route performance report had been used every year to really look at those four or five routes, they haven't been performing since we started. There's been a change, the business went out of business, those types of things. Um, we hadn't made any changes. So now we have about 12 routes that are not meeting those thresholds and commuters are not least of which, but there's other uh, adjustments to make. We just sent the, out the draft of the route performance report and said, folks, on those underperforming routes, looking at 52 million and looking at what we need to do, I need you to ride the buses and to assess and to see what they would suggest on making those improvements. Well, could you downsize the size of the vehicle? And then if it's under 16, you don't have to have a CDL driver. Those are all kinds of, of options that would be part of this analysis. Absolutely. Absolutely. As you can imagine, we're already starting to get emails from people who are concerned about cutting costs or cutting routes. I'm getting one from Northeast Kingdom Trails who are, I think they're on the list and uh, we'd rather not see that. Uh, trails don't ask for a lot of help from the state, but you know, we're gonna put our plug in for that to uh, keep that route going if we can. We had that conversation uh, 
yesterday after the conversation when we brought that forward, I was like, boy, look at FERC. And, but it was the first year. We usually do three year yeah. um, uh, new start assessments. Um, the IIJA allows us to use CMAC dollars for more than just the three year new start. Uh, we can now fund that forever. That's a huge difference because of our for funding formula. And when I go through the budget, I'll, I'll demonstrate that um, we've got a year or two, the Canadian border's open. We understand that there's some really good um, tweaks that they've, they've made. Uh, we, we don't need to cut, we need to fully address those, those roots and maybe make cuts where they make sense. But um, that's a great example of where it doesn't make sense at this point. It's taken a long, a long time to get to that point to pull a uh, rug out from under this after the first year would be um, probably a, a you know, premature. Yeah, I think it takes a long time for people to figure out where that where that works going and if the service is there. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Great. But that didn't take long. I had the conversation yesterday morning. <laughs> um, so. Uh, uh, the Transportation Command Management Grant Program was uh, started by uh, 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 these committees uh, three years ago. Um, it's uh, called the Mobility and Transportation Innovations Grant Program, or the MTI Grant Program. It's managed by Dan Courier, our Go Vermont Program Manager. He replaced me as a previous Go Vermont Program Manager. And it really is to um, help people access more modes, reduce the use of single occupancy vehicles, reduce greenhouse gases, all of those things that you see in this wheel of TDM tools. And through the first two years, we uh, uh, have been supporting micro trains of pilots and studies, feasibility studies with those funds, uh, bike share and e-bike programs, uh, public transit rider support, incentives, communications, um, uh, those types of uh, programs. Uh, we did provide a telework resource uh, through CAFMA, uh, who was really uh, trying to help the Hill institutions uh, wrestle with this new normal that uh, Senator Maz was talking about. Um, and uh, the car share mobility support, uh, we are uh, you know, very much involved in those projects. Dan Career uh, is more than happy, uh, looking forward to coming and sharing more details about this type of activity. This year, uh, more e-bike share programs, expanding that they have been utilized and people are interested. Um, we're starting a new operations, five new micro transit pilots I'll get to right after this. Um, very uh, thankful that the... Yeah, um, and, uh, and we're going to be... Uh, yeah. So we'll also, that, that's a good example of being able to pull in the new uh, housing. Uh, and they're saying, hey, maybe would they have some e-bikes to utilize some mobility um, off, uh, out of those hours. We're really excited about that pilot. Um, and uh, certainly we use some of these funds to try to get people back on the bus and ensure that it's safe and clean and fare free, um, or it was. So this was uh, basic information generally for the houses that benefit, but if you remember, it really the concept is moving from a route, hoping that our times and our bus stops are serving the most people, to just draw, drawing the uh, regional service uh, for demand response, allowing for pickups closer to an elderly or person with disability or a general public member, bringing them as close to their destination as possible. No, no uh, surprise. Salespeople telling me it's going to increase ridership by three point five percent. You know that that hasn't materialized. It's you know, it increase cost, and it did increase cost to an extent. Right, what we did in Montpelier was we had three vehicles already through the capital shuttle, the city uh, commuter or the uh, city uh, circulator, and Montpelier Hospital Hill. So we already had three of those vehicles. The Transition to micro transit was maintain three vehicles with a thirty thousand dollars software as a service with their tablets and now uh, with a little bit more of a, a call center it's costing um, uh, a little bit more. The pilot has not uh, been able to be managed the way that we were anticipating to begin with driver shortages reduce those buses from three to two 
and then the numbers just started, you know, kind of plateauing. It, it was a real disappointment to VTrans. Um, not that GMT could have done a lot about it, um, but we are pressing them to put the service back on as designed. So I do have these apples to apples comparisons in terms of cost. But it's a new technology. It's we have successful case studies all over the country. Um, we the current ridership was plateauing before uh, the pandemic. And we just thought this may be more flexible and more convenient for all these people. And it does speak to equity because the people with Medicaid or the elderly, disabled, um, are, and the general public are all using the same infrastructure and system and vehicles. Everybody gets the same. And um, so in Montpelier, it has, it has worked to do that. But we're learning that 70% of the trips are the Montpelier Hospital Hill route. So do we reinstitute, reinstitute that with that one vehicle and then use the other two vehicles for demand response to and from that trunk service? Almost the last mile, first mile, which is overwhelmingly nationwide, um, the most common use of micro trains, of getting people to the trains and the buses, um, to the fixed route services. So, but for us, as you can see uh, in the map, uh, we have five new pilots that we were able to fund primarily through the assistance of, of, this, uh, of these transportation committees, where you made available 1.25 million uh, for the non-federal share for these three pilots over the next three years. So Windsor is starting next month. Uh, Manchester is putting their RFP out uh, for that type of service. Starting service. Not starting service. service. Yeah, and um, it's a big planning and outreach, trying to uh, stand up the advisory council, the biggest uh, metric uh, to success uh, that we've seen is community involvement, and you've been involved in this one, um, and that's been key. Uh, Middlebury, Barry, as you can see, Rutland, Manchester, Windsor. All of these are so disparate because we're trying to identify the best use for micro transit service in Vermont, um, and we're hoping that in addition to Montpelier. Uh, that will be partially revealed through these next five uh, studies. Is it an area like Windsor without public transit, but has quite a bit of demand response service for the elderly and Medicaid? Is it a Morrisville, or is it Barry, where we are going to uh, bring folks from, the, uh, from a larger area into the city to access the, the core services? We don't know, um, and um, I don't think anyone does. I'm on a, a, a transportation research board, and I'm on the the webinar trail around the country providing our uh, experience and plans and uh, we're, we're far ahead of most rural areas. And Russ, are any of these going to be with vans instead of the small cutaways? Because I think that was one of the popular weaknesses. Yeah, that was a concern and, and certainly I can understand that. We have funded GMT to, to purchase the, va the vans. Uh, when you're talking about a seven person van and, and getting in and uh, you may be you know next to right next to yeah you know unhoused folks and those types of things i don't know what that's going to do sure. but it certainly would help a little bit with operations not much um, in terms of the cost per hour but it's more it could be a better marketing piece and it could uh, be more efficient why wouldn't we want to do that more stills looking at vans not colorways and then the cdl driver um, as you mentioned um, trying to uh, you know uh, deal with that issue. Who do you commuters with a oh, 15 passenger van? I drove it for a long time on Route 2. Um, so, it, but it, it takes a lot to organize it. You've got a bill and so forth. I had one question, and you keep talking about um, um, the Medicaid piece. And um, is there a current discussion around reimbursement and is there an interplay between zero fare and Medicaid rules that would say if you're if you're giving Senator Ingalls free why should I why should we pay for me who might be going to a Medicaid funded appointment so um, are we actually compromising our ability to get those Medicaid dollars with our fare free and I'm, I'm just asking yeah. the question and in other words, free is for everybody, whether you're on, you know, uh, 
Medicaid, which does require that. Um, and, and so um, what is the status yeah, of that? Free to the individual is not free to the system. Right. I know. I mean, there's no all, such thing yeah. as a free lunch, right. and there's no yeah. such, it's <laughs> getting paid for yeah. somewhere. But um, the whole thinking behind the braiding of the Medicaid and the EMD was to get the advantage of that Medicaid funding, which is a lot of on demand, um, because particularly in rural areas. So I was just wondering to what extent we uh, complicate or um, have a negative impact on revenues yeah. um, from from that uh, program uh, by this fair free policy. To an extent, it is affecting our demand response services generally are free to the individual. And that is the services that the NEMT, non-emergency medical transportation uh, program uses, is that infrastructure, that dial a ride service. Um, in those instances where you could offer a bus and you could charge twice the fare, um, those revenues are being lost. And in Chenton County, it's a much larger number because it's got more buses. Mm -hmm. For us, uh, we're not seeing an appreciable difference. There's other factors like uh, the per member, per week uh, numbers um, uh, or uh, clients have gone down uh, since COVID. Um, and so there's uh, fewer dollars going out to cover those types of trips. And um, there's, they, I believe, VPTA just saw, uh, signed a six-month extension with DIVA, uh, Department of Vermont Health Access, to uh, continue uh, providing the services while addressing some of the shortfalls that have been identified um, with these new costs that are associated with transportation services. Mm -hmm. So in the zero fare study, we do show that in addition to potentially uh, going back to fares in the urban area is to charge a, a nominal fare for demand response, microtransit, it's, it's a little more expensive as you mentioned, um, and to capture ADA services as well, we can charge double fare. If there's no fare, we're losing that. Mm -hmm. It's a big killer for, uh, it's, a, it's a big issue for, uh, yeah, for these areas. Yeah, sure. And for, uh, we're hoping that we can uh, continue to work with DIVA or, and DPTA to overcome those challenges. If we have a better system and, and a better service in place, we're going to have to find a way to make this work for everybody. But your braided service uh, model is something that we continue to, um, uh, to try to um, uh, maintain. And uh, we're even thinking of uh, going out on the street with a, uh, a study to identify what the braided service model in Vermont means for all of Vermont, not just our program or the DIVA program, and what it means in the future as we look at these types of services. Well, it was, I think, around 13 million at one point, so it was not inconsequential. It was 15 now. 15. And that's the, the delta they're trying to work on. Um, but um, it's it's been challenging. It's it's going to be challenging for us too because of these these cost increases that we're seeing across the board. We have a hugely hugely successful program in, in South Zero with the cider group. How is that funded? Because they, I know a lot of donations, but that's a huge success up there. It, it is public trans. They do all the private bring up the doctors' appointments and everything. It's, uh, it's meals on wheels. Uh, yeah. Is that any funding at all from some? Uh, they're a subcontractor to GMT, and so GMT isn't out in that area providing the services. They're paying G, uh, CIDR. CIDR pays for that 20% non-federal match with those local funds you're talking oh, about. That's why we donate. Uh, yeah, that comes and, and CIDR really benefits from doing more than just transportation. Not only Meals on Wheels, right. but all, that, all the social engagement that they do yeah. is really a, a, a model that would could could be replicated and, and serve other areas. Other, other areas do it state. There's cider's the only one. I not like cider. Not okay. like cider. Um, very successful. Very yeah, successful. It's, they've done some um, with um, RCT with school with kids with different school schedules, um, transport, for example, um, and so there are, but um, not the. I don't think on the meals on wheels sort of that. But the volunteer drivers are, you know, um, you're going to put somebody up, a vehicle up on the Newark Ridge, you probably are using a volunteer, but they're harder to come by. Um, 
We're, we're curious if, um, in addition to NEMT and our fixed route services being graded, is there more AHS activities that can be um, managed by VPTA? Um, because again, if we have these regional mobility managers doing more for you know, other programs reach up and the like, um, there could be some uh, additional benefits. And that's kind of what we wanted to pull out of that assessment of the graded service model. Um, how, how, uh, how, more, how much more could we do? And would that be more effective than having different divisions and different entities or agencies uh, trying to uh, largely uh, replicate or become redundant in some of these scheduling dispatch functions? A lot, a lot to assess, but right now, first is fix it um, and, and maintain the, the well, current service. What would be doing scheduling? Where would the redundancy occur right now? Uh, like Department of Corrections, um, and they have a secure transportation. DCF mm -hmm. has kids that require child seats. They have contracts with other people that are oh, not yeah. VPTA, uh -huh. and so they're making those calls and trying to match Oh, yeah, the because... DCF had this big scheme they were going to save money, and it didn't. We budgeted the savings, and it didn't materialize. Um, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Um, as far as the sightings on these on these new places, are they um, are you sighting around hospitals, or is that that's is that the main driver? Services um, uh, were a part of the consideration. When we did these feasibility studies, we did 12, and we went to our six local providers. Advanced Transit's small enough and, and doesn't isn't looking at this right now. We said, let's pick two for feasibility studies, and then let's see what that means. And that is the areas that they, in the regional level, are hearing about the paucity of demand or, or, or services. Morrisville, there's going to be a new housing uh, uh, program that will be looped in. It's going to be Copley and uh, most of the residential areas. Barry, it's going to be a little bit different, but that is part of it is uh, is connecting people to essential services. Absolutely. And are all your vehicles? Are you? And I I feel kind of foolish about asking this question. Right. All your vehicles, are you compliant with, did you have to be compliant with ADA or is there, so everyone? So, so you must have a little problem with some of these vans. I mean, when you're trying to cut services down, are these vans are ADA compliant um, for the most part? For the most part, if we're going to use uh, federal transit money, yeah. uh, they, you're going to have to be ADA. Uh, but we have a bunch of vans that have ramps um, that will hold one wheelchair and, and, and that that's maybe all we need um, and certainly all the cutaways and the other buses we use um, are ADA compliant and that's and that does allow us uh, to manage them in a little bit more fungible way where we don't have to worry about uh oh that vehicle needs to pick somebody up and it's not ADA compliant and now you know that it becomes very inequitable um, so that's where we are uh, just a few more slides and um, I very much appreciate the extra time. Um, a transit app. When we go to the airport, we look at the train schedules. It's the first thing you want to know, where's the bus? And 123 routes are captured um, throughout Vermont. It's free to the public. We spend about $15,000 um, to provide this service. And it really is uh, what you see in cities and the like. It's right size for Vermont. It's working very well. And we just upgraded to what they call the Transit Royale there in Montreal. Um, and uh, the Transit Royale allows for feedback. How was the bus on time? Was it clean? Um, uh, rate it and, and make comments. That's the type of information that is more important than any other information we have uh, that we can get, and it's new. And so this is a good step in the right direction. E-buses, uh, you're looking at an electric uh, uh, model from Latenda. This is being uh, developed outside of Montreal uh, for uh, no, no coincidence there, or just a coincidence there. Um, we uh, work with VEIC and put applications together for our low and no emissions bus program. Uh, with the utility, the provider, uh, with VTRANS, and with their assessment and ongoing case studies, it has really proven to win the day. We're six for six in applications, and um, as a result, we're, we're doing pretty well. Uh, we just did sign a MOU with the Department of Environmental Conservation for 2.2 plus million to, from VW funds to help on that match, non-federal match. 
They do, and um, they, uh, they approached us, and I wished I had approached them previously, but we now have the ability to uh, uh, use those funds for the non-federal match on these awards, which can be 85% federal. So this could mean that we replace 25 large buses, we can't replace cutaways with the VW funds, um, large buses, um, and actually uh, spend less from state and um, local funds than if we replace it with a diesel bus. That's a good step in the right place. We're learning a lot. Um, the overall range um, that the buses currently have can replace 80% of our routes today. And those ranges and those, <coughs> and those specs are improving every year. And certainly um, we've got a ways to go. The big surprise here has been the charging issues. Because you um, rust along the long extension cord, they follow the bus. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> they only go as far as the extension cord. I'm photoshopping that out. Um, but uh, yeah, and so uh, this is a good example of these buses haven't hit the US market. We will get the first four that the FTA has waived um, to come into the market. And uh, they've been developed from the ground up. They're lighter, the cabins are heated, are insulated for better HVAC uh, efficiencies, Boy, dual nice. turn, and they're seven to 12 year buses. Right now we replace uh, cutaways as five year buses. Wow. We cannot buy five year electric buses because of that increased yeah. capital. We are only gonna look at seven or 12 year buses. This meets mm -hmm. the, uh, fits the bill. And uh, we're Will looking for that long. Uh, the, the, this one, 160, 180 miles, which would cover no, no, the, the battery. Yeah. Light, light, light oh. battery. So we do uh, purchase, we have been purchasing warranties on that, on these. Uh, they're pretty expensive, I understand. The battery's a big, big factor. A couple hundred thousand dollars, yeah, absolutely. No engine, you're gonna have something. And so um, uh, the good news is we haven't seen uh, batteries uh, being the issue, and we need them to last for 12 years, and then maybe they can be used downstream on mechanics okay, or stuff. That, yeah. Well, but we are protected at this point until we can get through some of these life cycles and yeah, see. Yeah, it's a learning curve. Yeah. 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 Well, and that learning curve, again, the, because our phones charge and our cars charge, yeah. I wasn't yeah. expecting that half of the downtime related to e-buses are because of the charging infrastructure. And it's just a lot of electrons going in, um, and that's a lesson learned, and we're looking at other options. But that's, you know, it's been an overall positive experience, but not without its uh, hiccups. So. Where did you say these were made? These are made out of, um, outside of Montreal, and they're standing up a facility outside of Detroit, and one of those- Is it different than the other electric bus company from Quebec? There's uh, Nova is the other one, and they, they are totally different, although a lot of the managers and uh, people are from Nova. Okay. Well, it sounds like, though, you know, given the group that we had in here before, and I think we're going to continue to hear it, is that as this technology comes forward, we're just, we're going to have to learn. We're going to have to learn, and it's, there's going to be some learning, you know, try not to repeat the mistakes of the past, but you're going to learn. And it's, it, there's going to be some failures, but that yeah, can't, that can't, can't def, yeah, I mean, that can't define the program, you know, that yeah. just can't. Interesting, and, and uh, yeah, it was just one of those things where uh, I, it was a blind spot for me personally, and uh, but now uh, we know that we have to redouble our efforts on the charging infrastructure considerations. How many are running now? Because I see the one electric bus sometimes. Mm -hmm. there, there's six on the road now, two being registered, another four to six coming in this fiscal year. And they're in regular service. And they're in regular service, and they're putting them around to show different you know, usages, the hilly areas, the longer routes, um, and they do want uh, the public to see. But, uh, one of the big limiting factors is the cutaway replacements haven't had the range that we needed. The, the 140, 180, they're about 100 now. So we've been waiting for testing to come through for a better mousetrap, for a better option. Yeah. I think we have one, um, but all I know is what the last salesperson tells me. Right, so and we'll the wait. cold weather, have you had any like really cold weather where they just, the, the range is so much? About a 30% give back. Um, and uh, the HVAC is, is such a pull and such a draw that many of these models have a diesel heater on top of the bus. Yeah. And um, even though they comply with uh, you know emissions, it's not something that- uh, Doesn't have a good look. No, well, and it reduces the greenhouse gas pickups. It does, it does. And, um, and so, uh, but that's why this, this cabin is insulated. 
right? Yeah. And that's why they're using lighter componentry for all of those things that um, so many of these electric buses were just take the drivetrain out, right. put in that, and see what happens. And um, we're, and they're learning as well, right? Exactly. Um, and so this one, you know, say that's a heat pump for heat. It that's does. what they're doing with the cars. Yeah. yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, it's they say it's, it works great until ten degrees or yeah. colder. Yeah. That's we got to see the yeah. wood fire your car. Yeah. Coal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, those are ski van ones with, yeah. with a wood stove. <laughs> those go. Like, you had said um, the nominal fees that you're charging back um, now, it, well, and you probably had said it earlier, and I apologize. What's that putting back into the system as far as money? So the nominal fees from the, the amount of you know you're charging now for fares that you weren't far charging before. What's that put back in the system? Money about about two point two million dollars if ridership continues on the current trend. And uh, when we provide the fare free analyses, you'll see it pretty uh, spelled out: four hundred thousand, four fifty, something like that on the ur on the rural side. Yep. Two point two on the urban. Yep. And that's why in urban they're they're looking at a different approach. Yep. Um, uh, we are partnering with AHS not only with their DIVA program, but we have a recovery and job access ride. Um, so we have demand response for elderly and people with disabilities. We now offer services for those in recovery to keep them in recovery, to access the um, uh, appointments and counseling that they wouldn't otherwise be eligible for. And we're also offering job access for a week or two, just a week or two, to get to and from a new job opportunity, get a paycheck to fix your car, buy a car, get a carpool, We'll work with the employer to get a van pulled together, um, but uh, job access uh, is one of the best ways to keep people in recovery, and it's also to keep people from spiraling, uh, you know, uh, into having to be in recovery. We've lost about half of our volunteer drivers. We're moving the program from our volunteer driver program to our community driver program. And you lost them meaning they could do it because of regulations or they just don't want to do it because they don't want to be in a car? COVID-related um, issues, uh, primarily the concerns. The risks or like regulations? Concerns. There's nothing to keep people from maintaining but you know, when we're uh, bringing in the masks and asking people to uh, pre-screen and identify if they have COVID, that did scare. And, and we and the average age is well over 60 for our community drivers or volunteer drivers. So we want to build that back. But we've always relied on volunteers to do 60 or 65 percent of these 750,000 demand response trips. And it was always uh, tenuous, maybe. And so what we thought is we have the full allocated transit rate at $100 or so per hour. We have a 65 cent per mile uh, option. What's that middle ground? Is there an hourly wage that we can pay people to drive the sedans at the providers? Can we contract with them like a Uber or Lyft driver, giving them the tablet and giving them a different rate so that it's costing us $30 an hour rather than $100 an hour? And so we're really trying to fill in that middle uh, area, $40,000 uh, media buy. Uh, we're hoping that it results in an extra 100 uh, statewide volunteers and uh, trying out some of these pilots for those other options. And if we get somebody driving, for pay rather than for volunteer uh, mileage reimbursement, will they become a CDL driver? Can we get them in the pipeline? There's a DMV going by this so oh, yeah. there's a retirement. Oh, they're the retired. So we'll yeah. 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 How many trucks? Yeah, yeah. vehicles. Yeah, yeah, how many trucks do they have? <laughs> oh, yeah, they got plenty. Don't worry about that. They, uh, wow. You can be overloaded on the interstate today, you don't have to worry about it. Look at those trucks. Look at that. Jeez. Yeah. No one did say. Wow. There's some more. Oh, there's some more. It's coming. Unmarked. We've got a check for Wanda here. We've got a great lot of that. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, I'm all set. I will just say uh, you mentioned uh, okay. Commissioner Manoli. Yeah. Uh, she is putting in these posters at all the DMV stops as well, um, trying to help us. So another, you know, uh, intra-agency 
um, coordination to help us. But I'm done. Yeah. And thank, thank you for uh, the extra thank time. You. Exciting Everybody. stuff. Very always, exciting stuff. Always a good update. Yeah, that was uh, very exciting. Very, very, very informational. Across the, the very project, that's that's the one with Capstone. No, uh, that's, that's a different one. And so that's that's part of that middle area at $68 an hour. And if uh, GMT is providing those van trips at $82 an hour, again, bending that cost curve down, can they help us get more volunteer drivers in addition to provide those trips themselves? Um, and uh, we are ju they just signed the contract. Looking forward to that. And then we have the, the uh, micro transit in Barry for the last mile, first mile with Capstone. Is that gonna be that mobility for all model? I don't know, but this might be our best opportunity at this time to we'll see. That, that contract, because I know there were some issues earlier in the, on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's also through those issues. Both the, cap, both the macro transit and the uh, yeah. Well, Micro Transit, they're wondering, uh, GMT is wondering if they should do a turnkey approach with, let's say, a VIA, where they provide the vehicle fans, um, drivers, and they and uh, GMT just pays an hourly rate. Right. Um, that may be uh, one of the nuances of that uh, model to see when we go statewide and we uh, expand Micro Transit, are we going to do more of that turnkey transportation as a service rather than software as a service? Right. And I'm happy to come is interested in doing um, yes, yep, um, they're, uh, they're scaling up to such an extent, um, they did warn me that they're not going to be bidding on one vehicle here and there, mm -hmm. but um, Barry was interesting enough to them to do that, and um, they know that Montpelier, or uh, Vermont is the leader in uh, micro transit in the country, so they're maintaining that relationship with us. Okay. okay. And I was asked to deliver this for the next present presentation, okay. um, and from that's from Andrea. And uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So we canceled the last one. Uh, yeah. uh, Amy was in the building. Okay. Yeah, she's here. Okay. Yeah. She's here. She knows that. She knows that. Three minutes ago, that she was in the lobby. Hi. Okay. Hi. Hi. Amy Duff. Okay, Amy, you're on. You're right, you're right on. Whoa. <laughs> we don't wait for right right. Yeah, we're, we're right yeah. All right, give me one second here. I got to hand my presentation. What's your name? Hmm? Once you're in Zoom, I'll make you folks. Okay. Great. All right. We have Amy Duff, Bureau of Director of Policy, Planning, and Research. Wow, a lot of, a lot of stuff. I know. It's pretty scary <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Our uh, state network's a little slow today. Yeah, there's some problems uh, across the country and even in Vermont. So I really thought some. Or the uh, FAA, the FAA system was down yesterday. And then something was going on with Vermont. Um, I can't remember now what it was, but something was. Those airlines, they might as well pack it up. <laughs> oh my God, that's the last one. It's helping the trains. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. That's right. I thought of that. Buses. Join without Bodia or with? You don't need to see me, right? No. I'm going to get this system fixed up or something. You can project now. Okay. My mic is off. Speakers. It says they're off. Is it a Zoom setting? It's got to be on your computer.
seems to fix. How about now? We're good? You're good. Okay, you're on my video. You did better than I would have. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you folks may know, we actually don't use very, Zoom very much at the state. We're required to use Teams, so yeah. when we have to use it, we're a little fumbly. So, thanks for having me. Um, as the chair said, I'm Amy Bell. I'm the current director of the Policy Planning and Research section, and I'm replacing I replaced Joe um, Sigali back in August of this past year. So you may remember Joe from oh, yeah. Yeah. previous presentations. He retired and I've taken over for him, but I have been with the agency for about 25 years and worked in the policy and planning section for a little over 15. So I've got a lot of familiarity with what we do. So, um, so we'll get started. I, this is a really brief presentation. I think I'm gonna get you guys out of here quicker than you thought. But. So the policy planning and research section of the agency is really basically um, comprised of five different sections. We have obviously policy, planning, research, but then we have these other sections. We have the development review and permitting services section, and we also have the mapping section. So it's, um, it's a pretty diverse section, and, and I report directly to Michelle Boomhauer, who you all know very well. Um, this is, I always say about policy and planning, we're kind of um, the incubator of, of new and uh, maybe not always great ideas, but um, all the federal initiatives and all the, you know, like when, when you folks come up with an idea for a legislative study, we oftentimes will be the section that staffs that study, gets consultants and convenes you know, internal stakeholder groups and external stakeholder meetings with communities to discuss those topics, come up with a report, that sort of thing. So we're kind of the place where we're the kind of the incubator of all the new ideas that come in, whether it's a federal mandate or whether it's something that comes up at the legislative level or it's something that we as an agency and organization are interested in pursuing. So um, policy and planning, I'm gonna just kind of give brief overviews of each of these individual sections. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, um, there's 22 uh, full-time employees that are part of um, this section of the agency. And we deal with a lot of really diverse topics and issues. So I'm just gonna list a few here to give you just a general sense of what we do, but certainly if you have any questions. So we do all our statewide plans and legislative studies, um, all the federal policy development and grant applications, um, we oversee the Better Connections program. That's a grant program run through the agency. Um, the, the Transportation Planning Initiative, which is our cooperative relationship with the regional planning commissions, that's administered and overseen through our section. We also do corridor management planning now. Um, we've got a number of plans that are currently um, ongoing, the US2 ones that are mentioned on the slide, and Route 4 over in Hartford, uh, Woodstock. We also do all the long range planning. So we have a long range plan we're required to have by, by uh, federal statute. That's something that we oversee. And then we do all the modal planning. Doesn't matter whether it's public transit, um, bike and head, park and ride, highway, freight, all of those are overseen through our section. And then another big um, initiative that we're overseeing right now is the transportation equity framework um, work that's underway with the agency. That's also through our section. We do all the national and international coordination, so all this stuff related to interactions with folks at the federal level, New England, as well as the Canadian provinces, all that happens through our section. And then we do all the monitoring um, and implementation of any of those, any of the directives that come down from the feds um, in the federal legislation, such as the IAJA. I have a question about that. Sure. The, the whole wall that they put sure. that artwork on there. Because I heard that that wall was coming down or had to be rebuilt. Then I saw they put the artwork on them, but maybe that artwork is easy to come off. Um, if they're actual panels that are attached so they can be Just removed quite sure easily, we're... yeah. And I wanted to highlight these. This is an example of I an like idea. It, but I just wondered about if they're going to have to tear the wall yeah. down or we're going to lose the art. This is an example of an issue that came in. We were getting lots of requests from the agency for artwork in the public right of way, but yet 
We didn't have a policy regarding it. We didn't, we had inconsistent responses across the state and then it's like, all right, let's put some time and effort in and convene an internal stakeholders group to work on developing a policy. So we have this new policy called art installations in the state highway on his state highway facilities. And you can see some examples in this, in the bottom picture is actually some paintings, some murals that have been painted on the um, interstate. I thought it was just These are here in Montpelier. This is a gateway park. If, yeah. if you go down route two, they're, you don't see them from the road. They're on the back side, mm -hmm. but their plans are, their plans for up to 15 in total down here on these um, piers. Yeah, it'll be interesting how they, how the graffiti artists have a perspective or not. You know, they're not, they haven't, these were put up last fall. Yeah, and I'm, to my knowledge, there has not been any vandalism. Yeah. And there are a series that are over on the city did on the bike path as well. And those have been up for an extended period of time and had limited issues with the how they get there. So that's an example of pain at night. These people, they crawl over the edge of the interstate. I'm telling you, something. I know. Not, they do it. But. So, you know, that's an example. I just wanted to, to give of something that came up and how we resolved it and um, our staff oversaw that. I mentioned the transportation planning initiative and um, this is the agency's 30 year now. We just celebrated 30 years of our cooperative relationship with the regional planning commissions across the state and with the Chittenden County MPO. Um, and I've just provided some statistics here. This comes right from our um, performance indicating work that we do with them. We want to find out how many communities are participating. You can see the numbers are pretty impressive. Uh, 241 communities in the state are actively participating in transportation planning. That's a pretty remarkable number for a state of our size. And then you can see some of the other statistics. Um, a lot of the monies also, I think that's really important to highlight, is about 50% of the monies that we give the regional planning commissions go directly to support of municipalities. So it is a really important, the RPC is a really important connection. Is that a, just a, a budget? formula grant or is there it's a, it's, a grant? It, no, it, it's a formula grant. Yeah. Yeah. By size and district. Yeah. It's based on um, the number of towns that the community, the RPC serves, the uh, number of road miles, both state and, uh, and local roads, as well as population. So it's a, it's a formula based. And what's the, what's like a, uh, what, how much money are we talking? What's um, I think total right now we're around the total was around 2.3, 2.4 million dollars somewhere in that range. Ten or whatever. Yep. Yeah. And then on the right hand side is just the coverage map. We have a we have we have individual staff members who are assigned to specific regions. So we have direct liaisons working with those regions and being our eyes and ears and also helping these regions, but also the regions are tremendous help to us. They help us fulfill a lot of our federal and state requirements as far as public participation. They're an immediate outlet. If we need a response to something, we've got an outlet to just say, what do you guys think about this? And that's really unique and really valuable to us because it's uh, it's been a really um, beneficial collaborative relationship and we've gotten lots of really good feedback over the years. So then uh, I mentioned we also have the research section and there's a, we're federally mandated to have a research program. Um, and currently, uh, Emily Parkin is the current manager of that program. And we have five uh, research projects that are completed this year, seven more that are ongoing. She does a lot with technology transfer and transfer of information through lots of symposiums, newsletters, meetings. She's very connected in both the, the national as well as the regional level with other research institutions. Um, and then we do a lot of collaboration with other Vermont institutions, you know, whether they're colleges or they could be consulting firms. There's a lot of consulting firms that do a lot of really good quality research work in, in Vermont. And then also, as I said, she's very engaged at both the New England level as well as at the federal level. Is that the team that works on like how to use recycled glass as a road bed? She would be overseeing any research that would be conducted to see how we might utilize that. And then, or if it works. right. And then after that research was conducted, then it would be sort of handed off to the program manager in that area to figure out how might we then start utilizing this product and or this method um, in our actual practices. So again, it's very much an incubator of, of an idea and how might we then transfer it into meaningful use. And you work with the universities? Yes, universities and there's a number of consulting firms that also have 
significant research arms. Now we have the mapping section, and they're kind of the unsung heroes, I say. They're kind of, you don't hear a lot about them, but they do a lot of really cool things, and we all rely on them tremendously. All the maps you see generated by the agency is a result of our mapping section. There's five people in that section. They do all the town highway maps. You're familiar with that with your work, probably with your municipalities. They do all of the town highway mileage certificates. Uh, they maintain all of the GIS data related to transportation that all state entities and municipalities use. So um, they really play an important role and they support a lot of our other agency activities. They do way more than just planning work. They support the entire agency. They just are housed within the planning division. And then they deal with all the town highway reclassifications and they maintain um, one of our really recent things. And when Andrea has her chance to speak to you, I understand she's been delayed for today because you're not going to have a quorum, but when she does able to speak about our environmental policy and sustainability program, this transportation resiliency planning tool has actually been moved over into um, her shop, but it, it still is maintained through our mapping section, the actual um, application. And then we have the development review and permitting services, and these are folks who deal specifically with permits to the state highway system. So anytime someone is doing any kind of form of development or um, a utility needs a permit for work in, in the state highway, um, our utilities uh, permitting services folks are the ones who would be whom they interact with. They do a lot with trying to you know do do access management um, to ensure safety along the corridors um, and that sort of thing. And then we also have um, a staff person who oversees Act 250. He's the person who um, basically spearheads our, our response to any Act 250 applications as the agency is a party to many of those applications. Um, and then also the same person oversees our Act 145, the transportation impact fee management process. Um, that came through, what is it, 2017 maybe, you folks? That sound about right? That's the, it's the basically having developers pay small amounts over time towards improvements. Um, instead of this, you know, this used to have this problem with the last person in paid for all the oh, yeah. improvements on the roadway. That's what the Act 145 process is. Um, it's basically getting, bringing in funds in pieces and parts based on number of vehicle trips to then go towards large scale projects. So that the last, developer in doesn't have to spend an inordinate amount of money uh, on improvements. And this is my last slide, and this, I'm just leaving it with you just because if you ever have any need to, to reach out um, to any of the staff in my section, this is kind of a functional breakdown. It's got everyone's contact information. And then as well, sort of topically, what are the topic areas that they specialize in? And one thing I neglected to mention, um, at the beginning with the org chart is I mentioned, um, so between last year and this year, we've had a considerable discussion in the house about breaking out there's five sections currently in policy planning and research. Last year, there was a sixth, and that was the environmental policy section was also part of ours. And now the current proposal is to actually move that section, which Andrea Wright over here um, represents and Andrea's section is dealing with all of the climate, energy, EV. It's a huge, it's a, she's got a huge lift and sort of the newest and evolving things that we're doing um, are in Andrea's section. And Andrea will be doing her own presentation at the time. In planning now. But it's in planning now and it will stay in planning. It's just going to be doing a direct report to Michelle. That's the difference. So we're sort of elevating it organizationally and also additional staff have been hired. So at the time, a year ago, there was only two staff people. Now there are three and there's soon to be two more. So, so that would be Patrick Murphy, the work that you did. Exactly, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Patrick and Andrew. And, uh, yeah, so just wanted to let you know that Andrew will be giving you more details. Technically right now, I think you're still part of policy planning and research, but with this legislative and budget round, we're actually, she's gonna have her own budget line item um, and assuming everyone is in agreement that this change is beneficial, then that change will be formalized. So that's it for me. Questions? Thank you very much. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm sorry, Andrew, about today, but we had one is out and the other one had to leave, so okay. I do want to 
mess it all up. But it'd be better for you if they're here, <laughs> that they get it here. Yeah, yeah, I definitely would prefer that. And um, it sounds like Michelle will try to schedule us so that we can yeah, talk about the program and the budget all that. Senator time. Chitlin's been out for the week, and Senator Kitchen out of the league. So I said, well, I like to have more all everybody here. So yeah, do that. a lot going on with yeah. climate and energy. And and are you new, not that we're taking your testimony, but how long have you been with? I've been with the agency for 22 years, um, whole reason in the environmental capacity, but I'm new to policy and planning. Um, you guys uh, heard from Dan Dutcher last year, oh, yeah. so he retired right. and I took over. Um, Two years ago, I don't think last year he was here. I think last year right, was he, Patrick. Yeah. Uh, right at the beginning of the year. Yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of the electrification stuff, Patrick came in to present on. Um, you didn't seem that old, Dan Dutcher. Like, how many? Just... He's right on the, he's just about like a lucky retiree, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's in his early 60s, I think. So, yeah. He's having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> well, who was it? Said your wife was there for two days. Two days, and then went back to work for the bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, folks. Yeah, thank you.